I now can sing since I've been redeemed. I'm on the everlasting, the everlasting rock. I faith in Christ, my Redeemer King. I'm on the everlasting, the everlasting rock. This is the voice of hope. Then roll, roll, billows roll. I'm on the everlasting rock of ages. Roll, roll, roll billows roll. Rock. Welcome to The Voice of Hope. I'm J. Mark Horst, your host. And if this is your first time joining us for The Voice of Hope, we give you a special welcome. The Voice of Hope is a weekly Bible teaching program that's produced by Heralds of Hope. And we're an international gospel ministry using media to share the gospel around the world in English and 26 other languages. We use all forms of media, radio, internet, social media, and print to share the good news of Jesus Christ with people all over the world. If you've been tuning in during this month of June, you already know that our programming is a bit different than usual. And that's because June is our anniversary month here on The Voice of Hope, and we're using it as an opportunity to do some different things. Last week, we focused on the history of the ministry of Heralds of Hope the producer of this program, The Voice of Hope. And now in just a few moments, our executive director will present some teaching from the scripture relating to fathers and their responsibility. Now, whether you're a father or not, I think there will be things that you can benefit from as you listen. So stay tuned. Anthony? Here in the United States, we're celebrating Father's Day. So, J. Mark, I was just wondering, what memory do you have of your father? Well, let me share just two briefly. First of all, my dad loved to sing, and we were dairy farmers, and I can still hear him singing in the milk house. All that steel and concrete uh, in that environment made for really good acoustics. And then in the evenings, uh, we had a swing that was on a pole between two big pine trees, and he would sit on that swing, and while he was on the swing, he would sing. (laughs) And so... uh, he, he loved to sing. He loved music. And then the other memory I have is of him kneeling in prayer uh, at a chair in our living room every morning and every evening. I mean, I'm sure he missed a time or two, but that was a regular occurrence that I would see him do that. So that left a, that left a lasting impression on me. What's your favorite memory that stands out on your journey into fatherhood? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I have a lot of memories, and it's, it's hard to go with just one. Um, the memories that stand out to me are the births of our children. Mm. Uh, we have six children, and I had the opportunity to attend each one, mm. even the C-sections that were in the operating room. Mm. Of course, there's a story with each child, but you know we don't have time for all of that. <laughs> I especially remember when our first child was born and being amazed at this beautiful little person mm. that was given to us to raise and to love. Mm. And I was, it was overwhelming. And partly because, you know, the birth of a child is overwhelming and partly because I felt inadequate for the task. And now that first child, a little girl, is, yep. ma- is married and your youngest child is nine. So as you look back on your parenting, on your fatherhood, um, what do you think are the most important things a father can do for his children? <laughs> That's a good question. There are a lot of things you should do, uh, but for the purposes of this episode here, I narrowed it down to three specific building blocks Mm. that I think are very important. That's not to imply that they will grow up to be perfect adults, but to fulfill my duty as a parent, I'm called to build a foundation for them. Mm. So the first building block that I think we need is to build healthy relationships with our children. There's a familiar passage in Deuteronomy 6, 4-9 that's known as the Shema Mm. to Judaism, and it goes like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk with them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You know, here God, through Moses, 
is explaining how a father is supposed to go about teaching this law that they just received to their children. And first you need to teach them diligently. But then to reiterate that point, Moses gives them the whole circle of a day. Hmm. So sitting in the house, walking by the way, lying down, presumably to rest, and then rising again. The teaching needs to be intentional. And this kind of communication doesn't just happen. Mm -hmm. It needs to be somewhat a natural part of a relationship. Clearly, this is about teaching the truth about who God is and what our relationship is to him. Mm -hmm. But catch the proximity of the parent and the child here. They're to be together. And this teaching is to be carried out in daily in relationship. The short version of the story is that you got to be there with your children to build relationships. And that's that's what opens the door for the teaching part. And in today's society, with our challenges and busyness, I'm sure some dads are feeling a bit guilty about now. They perhaps feel like they aren't doing very well. Yeah, well, me too. <laughs> Obviously, there are some <clears throat> things that take us away from our family. And for many of us, we don't have the privilege of working on the farm or the family farm, as it were, or the family business. So there are times of separation from family and from children so that we can provide for them. But I want to focus today on the disconnected father. You know, you might be present, but you're disconnected. Mm. And the reason I bring that up is because it's a personal struggle as well. Mm. And I don't know if it's good news to you or not, but you and I have some biblical company in this. Mm. David, of all people, didn't do so well with his sons. If you look at 2 Samuel 13, 2, at the end of this terrible story of Amnon and Tamar, we have this line, when King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. Mm. And then I understand the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint, they add these words, but he did not punish his son Amnon because he loved him, for he was his firstborn. And if that doesn't convince you, then go to 1 Kings 1, six, where we find this parenthetical aside about Adonijah, another one of David's sons. And it says this, it says, And his father had not rebuked him at any time, saying, Why have you done so? He was also very good looking. His mother had borne him after Absalom. I sense a, a disconnected father here. Hmm. While he loved his children, he wasn't effective at building a relationship with them. The overall effect was a bitter and undisciplined prince mm. who made attempts at taking the throne from his father. Mm. Yeah, well, the kind of relationships spoken about in Deuteronomy chapter 6 build a level of trust between the parent and the child. And as you mentioned, David didn't seem to have much of a relationship with his sons. Isn't it relationship that impacts the effectiveness of discipline? Yeah, discipline is the next building block I wanted to talk about. And the main purpose of discipline is to teach our children, not just to make them more convenient. There are not a lot of verses that give a detailed instruction list on how to discipline our children. Mm -hmm. But I do think that Hebrews 12, 3 to 11, give us a good model to follow. In fact, I think it's the best model to follow by looking at how our Heavenly Father disciplines us. Let me read it here. This is Hebrews 12, 3 to 11. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Mm. Nevertheless, 
Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Here, God is described as disciplining us as a father disciplines his children, but not those who are not his children. I don't know about your experience, but disciplining other people's children doesn't go that well. <laughs> Again, the relationship, it, it's primary. Your children need to know that they're loved, even when they're being disciplined. Next, we use discipline as a tool to teach. I used to have this idea that God was up there with a big stick and waiting to punish me as soon as I did something wrong. And it was a bit of a, I guess you'd say an aha moment when I realized that this discipline has more to do with teaching than it does punishing. Mm. The wicked are punished, but the righteous are disciplined. God's purposes are always to correct and guide his children. God's intentions, according to the last verse, is to be partakers of his holiness mm. and to yield a peaceable fruit of righteousness. Simply put, mm. we're to become like him. Mm. And I think this gives us a model to follow when it comes to disciplining our children. Our purposes are to teach them and to guide them. You know, we set reasonable rules and instructions to teach them about how to do life. And ultimately, our purpose should be to point them to Christ. So you keep talking about the importance of relationships. What should the parent-child relationship look like? Mm -hmm. First, I'm not an expert in this. And I don't know when my children will listen to this, but I'm sure that if you ask them, they could give you a long list of my failures. Mm -hmm. So while I have some things that did work for our family, it, this doesn't mean that they're fail-proof or foolproof. I suggest that you figure out what works for your family and be diligent about it. That's good advice. <laughs> Keep in mind that the end goal is to build a healthy relationship. And then it gives space to teach our children and to point them to Jesus. The relationship building begins before the children are born. You know, dads, I'm talking to you. It's about your relationship with your wife. Mm -hmm. And I'm told that unborn children can sense stress and trauma. Just make sure that's not coming from you. And hold your babies. Cuddle them. They should feel comfortable with you too. When we were raising our children, there was a teaching going around that you should just let your children cry it out. And there may be times that you let them cry a little and then they go to sleep. But... We need to be careful with that. The parent should be the first source of comfort. And then as they get older, one of the ways that I found to build relationship is to answer the 101 questions that your two-year-old gives you. They're curious. You know, what's this world around them? What is the meaning of it? And it's a perfect opportunity to teach them about God and how the world works. They may not always be that bold to ask questions, so take the chance while you have it. One thing that our children enjoyed all through their growing up years was when I took some special time with them. Somehow, this got to be called their day, and <laughs> I don't know why. It began with wheelbarrow rides, and then it kind of morphed into trips to McDonald's for ice cream. I thought that as our children would become teens that maybe they wouldn't be interested in it, but that wasn't true. <laughs> in fact, the, the thing that changed it was became harder and harder to schedule. <laughs> And I've done everything from going to the park and pushing them on the swings to fishing to running for 10 miles with them, or with one of them anyway, to bowling, shopping at bookstores, and visiting art studios. And I, I had to learn to spend a little money with it. You know, I'm kind of stingy and reluctant to spend too much money on adventures, but I realized that if you buy a bubble tea or something extra, it helps to build those relationships. And just look for opportunities that are meaningful to them and schedule it in your calendar. And don't, don't be too practical. Like <laughs> I, I can tend to be practical with this, but do some things just for memory's sake. You know, there's nothing that beats coming home from one of these little adventures and hearing your son or daughter say, Dad, thanks. That was fun. <laughs> Another easy one that you can do to help with relationship Simply put that phone away and turn off the notifications. You know, a few things say to a child, you're not important, as checking your phone in the middle of a conversation. You know, and this is something that I feel bad even saying because I know I've failed in it. You're, you get a text or a call in the middle of 
hearing about a trivial event from the day or from school and you you want to pull out your phone to to read that or to answer the call and it's, what did I communicate? Well, you're not as important as this message. <laughs> and that's painful. <laughs> so you said there are three building blocks and you gave us relationships and discipline and from what you've said, they seem to be very much intertwined. What's the final building block? Be a godly example. We've all heard the saying, like, like father, like son, <laughs> or the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree is one I like to use. <laughs> and whether you like it or not, our parents are most likely going to be the examples of how we pattern our lives. As a father, all my shortcomings are on full display to the family. <laughs> they see them all. But that doesn't mean a godly man is a perfect man. King David, going back to him again, he's referred to as a man after God's own heart. He failed miserably. Rather, a godly man recognizes, confesses, and repents from his sins. What I would have told myself, though, if I could have talked to myself 20 years ago, <laughs> when I first became a father, is to be the follower of Jesus that you want your children to be. Mm. Simply be an example to them. And when you're not an example, the first thing you need to do is to acknowledge that to your children and to confess and repent because it happens. We know it does. That's right. Another thing that it can't be given enough of emphasis is to pray for our children. There's an old song by Phillips, Craig, and Dean called Midnight Oil. And the first verse, it says, Mama, you, Mama likes to burn the midnight oil down on her knees in prayer. And then it goes on. The next verse, it says, Mama's gone to be with Jesus. I've got a family of my own. Yet whenever the clock strikes midnight, you will find me all alone. And that's when I call upon Jesus for his wisdom and power, because he loves to hear a daddy's prayer, even in the midnight hour. Hmm. Now, our Heavenly Father cares more about our children than we do. And so it only makes sense to spend time praying for them. Yeah, speaking of prayer and its importance, our children generally learn how to pray by listening to us pray. And one for of the ways or for worse. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> one of the ways they learn that is in a family devotional time or family altar time. People call it different things, but what have you done that's been an effective example in that area of your family life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've tried various types of devotions over the years with our children and even tried different times a day. In the early days, we read Bible stories out of our children's Bible story books. And then later, we read through some books of the Bible. I recall our children asking to read some of the more prophetic books or the, the books you don't really hear about, much about in, in church, such as Ezekiel or Esther or Revelation. I often tried to do it out of an easier-to-read translation so that they could get a picture of the overall story. Mm -hmm. We also read books of a more spiritual nature, such as More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell, mm -hmm. and that kind of prompts the older children a little. Um, I did find that the younger ones then kind of glaze over, and so you have to switch back and forth with that. There are some good family devotional books out there as well, and then lately... Uh, we've been working on a Bible memory passage that our children have been studying for a Bible quizzing competition they're participating in. Now, family devotional times, they can become monotonous and a drudgery mm. if you don't watch it. Uh, it takes some parental creativity to keep it alive, <laughs> as what I've found. One of the things that has helped us is to follow a prayer calendar for some missionaries. Mm. And our children have actually gotten to know some of these people along the way. And they find it interesting to read their requests and then pray for them. And so it kind of gives them a connection, yet something to pray for. Right now, you know, we find the best time is in the evening, and they can wind down and go to bed. Uh, sometimes that's a time when some of our older children then come up with some interesting, deeper questions. <laughs> and, yeah, it's, it's tempting to shut them down and send them to bed, but those are the times that I need to engage and and discuss those things out. Yeah, and you can't really plan for those. I mean, you can, but it doesn't usually work. It doesn't it, it work. usually <laughs> is better when it's spontaneous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe bedtime doesn't work. or It or, didn't for us. <laughs> yeah. And there was a time when right after supper worked better. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it goes back to, again, finding what works for your family. And, you know, going back to Moses' instructions in Deuteronomy 6, 
they were to teach through every waking moment. It was a, a continuous cycle. And so that's why I think, you know, find what works, find what works for your family and your routine. You know, meal times are another time. Mm, Family excellent. meal times are a good time for teaching and discussion. Mm. And no doubt it can be challenging to keep the conversation on track and going in a profitable direction. <laughs> but the goal again here is to create space for these interactions to happen. Mm. You know, when you run with your calendar f- completely full, it's just it's just hard to have those teachable moments. And life, I think, needs a certain amount of boredom to allow for relationships and creativity to happen. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and tie this all together for us? Yeah, so I gave several practical illustrations here and we ended up back again with building healthy relationships. So that's the first building block that we gave. And this takes time and energy, but I think it's 100% worth it. Hmm. You know, Get to know your children. God made each of them with a unique personality and special gifts. Hmm. And we talked about discipline, which isn't a popular topic for today. (laughs) But when discipline is built on a healthy relationship and has the purpose of teaching and guiding our children to Christ, it can yield a peaceable fruit of righteousness. And then finally, there's no substitute for being a godly example for your children. And we we should be able to say, as Paul did in 1 Corinthians 11.1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. (laughs) These are the three building blocks you can use to raise your children and point them to Christ. Well, thank you, Anthony. Anthony's our executive director, and in that role, he's the recognized leader of the team here at Heralds of Hope. He also serves as a pastor, and I appreciate his insights into the Scripture. And I wanted him to have this opportunity to, we say, get his feet wet uh, by taking on this teaching for Father's Day. And I think he did a good job. Now, if you'd like to review today's teaching or share it with someone, you can request a copy because it's available in print, on a CD, or a digital audio file. Just ask for the Father's Day program, and uh, maybe you have a comment that you'd like to share with us. We'd love to hear from you. We plan to do a program later this month with your responses and your questions to both the Mother's Day program from last month and this program that you're listening to right now. The easiest way for you to contact us is to use our email address. It is hope at heraldsofhope.org. That's H-O-P-E at heraldsofhope.org. Or you can call us toll free at 866-960-0292. Or mail your request to the Voice of Hope, 6183 Lincoln Highway, Harrisonville, Pennsylvania, 17228. You can also review today's teaching or listen to archived programs by logging on to our website, heraldsofhope.org. To help this ministry financially, you can send a check by mail or you can donate securely online at our website, heraldsofhope.org. You can also call our toll-free number, 866-960-0292 and donate by credit card or use your debit card. God's grace accompanied by your fervent prayers and your generous financial support, enables the voice of hope to be on the air. Now don't forget to join Anthony and me next week for the Voice of Hope as we discuss together the future of Heralds of Hope. And until we meet again, War sees the whole world lives in peace Bitterness and hatred fade away What happens when men pray? When men pray, when men pray, the heart of God is touched. When men pray, as the Father's will is done, the whole world can be one. That's what happens when men pray.